Hello and welcome uh, to today's webinar here at Glasgow Caledonian University. It is organized within our project Mainstreaming Innovation. My name is Branka Dimitrievich and I will moder moderate today's webinar. I'm also a director of the project Mainstreaming Innovation. Uh, the project is funded by Scottish Government. Before we continue uh, with the webinar, just a few housekeeping points. This is a live event, as we always say, there might be a fire alarm. If it happens, we will have to stop, but we will continue later. If you cannot continue, uh, join us later, you will be able to watch video recording of this webinar. It will be prob probably published by Friday. Uh, another thing that could happen, some disruptions of during uh, the transmission of the we webinar on online uh, disruptions. Uh, if that happens, please try to reconnect and join us again. We plan to finish this webinar around 2 o'clock, but you can start using chat facility to ask questions at any point during the webinar. Before I introduce our speakers, just a few more words about our project. Uh, our project is about integration of sustainable infrastructure into the existing built environment. And we uh, co support collaboration between researchers of nine Scottish universities and uh, Scottish small to medium-sized businesses. Uh, infrastructure that we are talking about includes also landscaping and biodiversity and how it connects with water infrastructure, waste, infrastructure for energy efficiency, for energy uh, generation from renewables, for low carbon transport, and also information communication technology, or ICT, that can be used to monitor and uh, manage these infrastructures. The, link of, the links between these infrastructures, as presented on, on this slide, uh, indicate that the project will stimulate identification of potential synergies between different infrastructures and how they can be successfully integrated and how they use the landscape and biodiversity to mitigate the impact of climate change and improve the environment in which we live, uh, both built and natural. So uh, when a Scottish Natural Heritage uh, contacted us and suggested uh, to organize this webinar on exploring design for wildlife uh, friendly buildings and places, we were delighted because it really fits within our project. Our speakers today uh, will be Clive Mitchell and Carolyn Deasley. Uh, but before their presentation, we would like to show you a brief video that we filmed in April this year about landscaping and biodiversity at different estates, <coughs> healthcare estates, um, education estates, and housing estates. And the speakers are Rodi Yar, uh, of, who is environmental and energy manager at the University of St. Andrews, Catherine Dapre of Health Facilities Scotland, and Colin Reed of Glasgow Housing Association. This is a five-minute video, and we will show it right now before uh, we start. We continue with the webinar. Hello, my name is Roddy Yar. I'm the University of St Andrews Environment and Energy Manager. We have hundreds of acres of land across the university. We're integrated within the town in the university and we also have farmland that is um, farmed by tenant farmers. Our approach to biodiversity has been to understand the scale and complexity of the biodiverse landscape that we live in in St Andrews, the built environment and how that impacts on the nature of biodiversity in the town, in the built environment, in the gardens and grounds, um, in the wilder areas and also at the farmland level as well. So what we've tried to do is baseline our understanding in terms of species, fauna, flora and we've got a very good understanding and what we started to do right from the start was to put that knowledge on our website so that staff and students can understand what we're doing 
but also at a project level our design teams, our architects, our contractors can see where there are more important areas where there perhaps are protected species um, but also how much grass is in an area, how much um, farmed land is in an area, how much hard stand is available in an area and so they can understand the linkages between developments because we are a growing university, um, areas that we want to protect um, and areas that are heavily used by students and staff to go about their daily business. My name is Colin Reid, I'm Sustainability Manager for Glasgow Housing Association and uh, Glasgow Housing Association has about 45,000 uh, houses across the city of Glasgow although we're part of the Wheatley Group and we'll be uh, spreading across the central belt of Scotland. Uh, well, that's uh, just part of the video and you can uh, watch a bit more about uh, landscaping and biodiversity uh, at, if you watch the video on our website uh, in the section about uh, landscaping and biodiversity. Uh, today we have also online one of the speakers uh, who was in this video, uh, Radiyar, who is uh, at uh, the University of St. Andrews where he's environmental and energy manager. Uh, Rodi, can you hear us? Can you join us, please? Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, yes, we do. Uh, yeah. I would like just to ask you, uh, in relation to your work at the University of St. Andrews, uh, is there enough awareness among architects about uh, the use of biodiversity in the design of buildings? What is your experience? Did you have to guide them? Or did you engage also with some consultants who are specialists in this area? Um, I think the answer is it's mixed, depends on who you use. Um, architects, some are very uh, engaged in this in this area and want to encourage the installation of features um, and design ideas that enhance biodiversity as much as provide the operational requirements of the of the client. Um, so it is mixed. It's like um, a lot of consultants and, and advisors. It depends who you use. Um, we have encouraged it at the university. Um, design teams have taken on board our ideas and, and got on board with, with what we're trying to do quite successfully. Um, but we keep we keep talking to them, and keep trying to encourage them to innovate and think about opportunities. Um, we've used a number of ecological experts to help us to, to knit the two things together. Um, quite often there is a tension between getting a project that's fit for purpose um, and innovative at the same time in terms of biodiversity. So it's a bit of a mixed bag, but, but by and large, we've sort of said to, to our, our consultants, look, this is what we want, this is our strategy, this is why we want to do this, and they've got on board with those ideas. Radhi, uh, we have a question here uh, from Clive. Uh, Clive, you wanted to ask something, hey, Roddy? Uh, hi, Roddy. Yeah, just a follow-up to that, really. Um, I don't know if you saw the Scotsman yesterday, but there was a, a sort of trenchant opinion piece in there from Leslie Riddick um, on the eve of some um, uh, awards for um, uh, distinction in, in architecture and design for wildlife and so on. Um, and, and the main thrust of her piece was that the um, uh, they she was reporting. Uh, problems that people had in, in creating innovation in design uh, through the planning system where a lot of the barriers they were meeting were from in the planning system uh, in terms of it, it not fitting with the development plan or it not quite fitting with the conventional way of doing things and so on. Um, and uh, I just wondered if, if it, what had your experience been in terms of taking some of the, uh, some of those ideas to through the development system? Um, we we not had significant problems with planning for the built environment where we've incorporated um, some sustainability ideas and biodiversity aspects. That's perhaps because they haven't been significantly innovative, perhaps, or, um, I, I don't know, with the development plan. And things like SUDs are, are very much now part of the development plan. Green roof systems, um, small-scale biodiversity measures that we, we take, which wouldn't necessarily affect the, the planning system um, for biodiversity in that respect. So, But that, then perhaps we haven't done 
as as innovative a number of, of installations as perhaps we, we could have done with with our design teams and with the, the various schools and units that we build for. Okay, thank you very much, Rodi, for your participation. I think we can now start with your presentation, and I would kindly ask you, Clive, to uh, start your presentation now. Okay, thank you, Branka, and thank you, Rodi, for joining us. Um, thank you. So um, let me start by, um, some of you may remember um, Gary Larson and his Far Side cartoons from the 80s and 90s. And one of them sticks in my mind. Um, it shows a, an orchestra uh, ready to play a, a concert with the audience hushed, the conductor with his baton raised. And sitting at the piano is an elephant. And the elephant saying to himself, what am I doing here? I can't play this thing. I'm a flautist for crying out loud. <laughs> and I feel a bit like that today. Um, I'm a geologist by training. What on earth, earth am I doing here sitting to you talking about design? Um, and of course, the answer to that is uh, I'm not going to talk to you about design. I have lots of questions about design um, that have arisen over the last few years. I did some work around placemaking for Scottish natural heritage over the last three or four years. And throughout that process, um, the idea that design was a fundamentally important part of creating places um, and, and what emerges in the places that we create, um, including the, um, how rich they are for, for biodiversity, how well they sit within the landscape, the quality of those local environments, um, in many cases kind of comes down to detail ar around design at various scales. And in a sense, that's the kind of proposition that, that I was hoping to be able to explore with you um, today. So this is very much about, you know, my being really a bit of a daft laddie um, and Carolyn, my uh, colleague, a daft lassie, um, asking lots of questions um, about the role of design uh, in creating wildlife friendly buildings and, and places. So the, the purpose of these slides are really just to stimulate discussion and debate, really. Um, we're by no means sticking to a script, an SNH kind of version of events, as it were. Um, we want to kind of go well beyond that to explore the wider dimensions of the role of design in creating wildlife friendly buildings and, and places so that we have an understanding or begin to develop a better understanding of the, the dimensions of the problem, the landscape that it sits within. Uh, and then we can start to think, you know, if we are going to intervene, where we can add most value to that. So this is the broad um, structure of the, of the session. Um, we are very much about kind of picking your brains. Um, I'll show a few slides next to kind of help set the scene about why, why I think all of this matters. Um, and then leading through some aspects of design at various scales, um, starting with individual houses and buildings, then village, town, neighbourhood, uh, regeneration and developments in more urban settings, uh, the city region, the landscape scale, um, and also importantly, I think later, uh, retrofit. Um, you know, how do we kind of work this into the, the buildings and the places that we've created over the last 50 or 70 years or so? And after each of those stages, we'll pause for a few questions. We've got a slide um, to help sort of generate some questions around the, the issues that we've been discussing and exploring. Um, to help you know, stimulate discussion and, and basically feed off your uh, knowledge and understanding in, in these areas. If we've got the will at the end, uh, we'll carry on to look at some wider aspects of policy design, um, but we'll see how we're going for time. Um, some of the kind of major themes I think throughout worth keeping in mind at this stage is you know, we may well be able to furnish, and we can furnish, you know, several examples of of how all of this works well in particular examples. But for me, as a citizen going around Scotland and indeed elsewhere in the UK, um, I don't see a lot of this in my kind of day-to-day -day experience. So why isn't this mainstream, I think, has to be a fundamental question for us. How does all of this relate to creating and investing in assets to support wealth creation and well-being as a kind of bigger question? Um, issues to do with public engagement and their role in, and our role in decision making. Um, and we probably won't get too sidetracked by the last two, but um, they're arguably kind of fundamental aspects of the kinds of places that we get um, in, in uh, Scotland and elsewhere. So th this was a slide that uh, Jim McKinnon, the previous uh, chief planner, used in one of our sharing good practice events a number of years ago, where we were looking at various aspects of um, uh, placemaking and the role of nature and landscapes in that. And um, 
the, the kind of main message from this is that the, the, the developer building model uh, in the UK and Scotland um, is really quite kind of short term really um, in the sense that the builder has typically an interest in the place up to the point of sale of, of the building or the asset um, and the longer term potential social or environmental consequences arising from those places and the buildings in them and so on uh, are not the responsibility of the developer. Uh, they typically fall to the public sector, uh, local authorities, organisations like SNH and CEPRA and others to kind of to pick up those sort of wider um, social costs and environmental costs. Um, so um, I guess there's a question here for me about, you know, who has this kind of long term interest in place and place shaping um, and making sure that developers do create places that, that invest in assets for well-being and wealth creation uh, in the longer term. Uh, just to illustrate how significant a problem that is, this is a slide from uh, Harry Burns, the Chief Medical Officer. Um, it could be, for argument's sake, Carlton in the Glasgow area, uh, where the man walking down the path there would have an average life expectancy of birth of about 54 years, um, which is about 20 years less than it might be if he was lucky enough to be born in Bangladesh or some other developing countries and so on. And as a statistic for a, for a highly developed country such as the UK, um, that, that's pretty appalling really. And the, um, the, the, the population health work that Harry and others have been doing in the west of Scotland um, essentially argues that every, when it comes to population health, everything matters and everything includes uh, the quality of the built environment and places in which people live and work and play out their lives and so on. Um, so there's a really fundamentally you know, vital aspect of all of this around population health. And uh, Russell Jones from the Glasgow Centre of Population Health, another contributor to one of our events, um, you know, put out the message that you know, a pretty good measure of a sustainable place is one that makes people healthy. And the, the roots of the planning system as we have it um, are obviously are founded in the kind of po population health issues of the 19th century. Um, which are very different to the population health issues of, of today and you know arguably we need to be thinking about how the kinds of places that we're developing um, help to address um, the the population health issues of today and for you know future generations so this is maybe a quote that we'll come back to as a theme throughout the presentation um, if you do what you've always done you'll get what you've always got so if, if the kinds of places that we're putting up today um, are not particularly friendly towards wildlife and creating high quality environments in which people can live out their lives, um, then, then maybe we ought to think about doing some things a bit differently. And a lot of what I'm going to go on to say um, derives from, from this book. Um, I think it was written in about 1972. It's quite a chunky tome, um, but it's actually quite an easy read. It's divided up into lots of short, um, very short kind of chapters, um, which basically describe elements of place um, starting at the kind of wider, widest kind of landscape scale, talking about regional transport systems and um, uh, flood management and things like that, and then gradually kind of works down through cities and towns and neighbourhoods, uh, all the way down to individual buildings, streets and neighbourhoods, um, individual buildings, uh, gardens, and ultimately how to arrange the ornaments on your mantelpiece. It is, after all, a Californian uh, 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 authors who, who, who wrote this. Um, but the essential point they make in each of those chapters when they're talking about a particular issue and scale of design, um, they, they point to kind of neighbouring scales that are relevant to the particular issue that they're talking about. Uh, and indirectly then, they make a case that detail at every scale, all the way down, for, for, you know, not quite the, the um, the way that you arrange your ornaments on the mantelpiece, but the way that you design a house and the building and the materials that you use and so on and so on, all ultimately affects the kind of places that we, that we create and the social and environmental features that emerge at various scales of that attention to detail and design. Uh, so that's going to be a kind of running theme over the next few um, slides. So let's start with um, questions of scale and looking at individual houses and, and buildings. And there's a bunch of issues here that relate very directly to um, the opening slide that Branka put up and, uh, and talked about. Um, and the, I mean, one of the key things for me in that slide was that I think we probably all recognize that all of these elements in, in creating a building are vitally important. 
Um, but somehow the responsibility for those different elements is, is quite strongly divided in the kind of administrative architecture uh, of, of the kind of public sector. And sometimes maybe uh, we don't talk to each other as much as we should, and we don't have a shared understanding about the outcomes that we're trying to achieve uh, through the buildings that we're creating and influencing and so on. And hence, I think the, you know, the very important word of integration uh, that lies behind the project that uh, Brank is behind here. Um, let me go on and show you know, a few examples of, um, of how some of these things might be realized in practice. Um, a nice example of a green roof here with multiple uses. Uh, quite an extreme case, I suspect. Um, but that can, you know, these green roofs can appear at you know, all sorts of different scales, um, here on the porch as opposed to the, the main roof of the house. Um, and this will have a, an important impact on um, uh, runoff uh, on, on the house and the curses. And I know that um, Harriet Watt University were doing a few a piece of research, I think it was under the kind of acronym drainage, uh, appropriately enough, where they were looking at the um, building standards and the kinds of the impact that that might have um, on the runoff rates um, on a building and its curtilage into the kind of pipe system and hence the drainage system and where the pinch points of that might lead to very localized flooding in and around the building and so on and how that might be reduced by taking a kind of if you like a mini catchment scale approach to the design of the building and its curtilage uh, in relation to likely impacts of climate change and the increased frequency and intensity of rainfall events and things like that and at the time certainly when i was speaking to them a few years ago their general finding was that building standards are likely to be left somewhat wanting in relation to the sorts of events that are likely to occur as a result of changing climate over the next few decades and you know here's a kind of quirky example of the same sort of thing with a bus shelter in uh, san francisco and a nicely you know some of these, the scales inevitably between individual buildings and um, uh, neighborhoods and landscapes and so on, invariably are very blurred and fuzzy. And I think that just reinforces the point about it being quite difficult to draw what are often quite hard artificial administrative boundaries between these various interests in the scale of place and place making. And here's a nice example of a, of a house in a grove. Um, so, again, this theme of you know, conservation of resources um, in the round um, sits, I would see it as very comfortably with, with the kind of issues of uh, building for uh, wildlife friendly buildings um, uh, as well. And obviously, when you start thinking about life cycle costs, um, you know, we need to be concerned about the potential impact of, of various um, products on the environment as much as how the building itself um, enables or provides an opportunity or a constraint, as the case may be, uh, for wildlife. And a lot of these ideas, I should emphasize, uh, come from work um, that Howard Little did. Uh, I don't know if you know his book, Eco, Minim Eco Minimalism, if I can say the word, The Antidote to Eco Bling. Um, and his kind of fundamental point in that book is that um, there is an awful lot of eco bling, kind of fads and fashions, in trying to promote kind of um, almost like conspicuous consumption, uh, expression of the way that we uh, define ourselves by the houses and the buildings that we create and the, the visibility of various kind of sustainability features and so, and so on. And sometimes they're not actually the most ecologically um, efficient or effective means of dealing with the particular problem that they're designed to solve. And um, so his kind of fundamental point is being clear about the problem um, and then, you know, designing a solution for that. And obviously, you know, that's the core aspect of design is being clear about the problem and then designing a solution, um, form follows function, all that kind of stuff um, that uh, addresses the problem that you're trying to solve. And, um, you know, for me, certainly in, in recent years, uh, that whole aspect of kind of problem definition is, you know, I, I think a vitally important part of and sometimes an underplayed aspect of problem solving and policy design and implementation. And a, a similar kind of uh, set of issues around materials choice, um, the naturalness or otherwise of that, um, sometimes the, the local economic benefits in terms of um, local traders being able to, to design and build with materials and so forth. Um, and you know how well, how buildings uh, fit into uh, or give a sense of local identity like local identity and uh, promote pride of place, the sense of place that we have, uh, which is an important part of the way that we define ourselves and, uh, and, and see ourselves. 
Um, so I guess an overall kind of theme is the, is the bottom point of here, here of um, designing with the kind of existing grain of the landscape and the natural environment in which particular buildings are placed. Uh, and to my mind, because that's a highly variable, uh, you know, landscapes vary at all sorts of scales at a very local level, um, we ought to see, in my mind, um, much more diversity uh, in the quality of design for buildings and places than perhaps we're seeing at the moment where uh, there's a kind of an off-the-shelf uh, economically efficient solution that, that maybe isn't well suited or placed uh, to fit within the landscape in a particular place. And just to illustrate that, um, you know, we started off with some illustrations of uh, green roofs and so on there. A lot of these ideas can come down, you know, right down to the very kind of detailed level of individual bricks. Uh, and these are some ideas that have been um, put out at various kind of design shows over the last few years, uh, looking at features to help bats or swifts um, or brick biotopes, as the case may be, um, designing in to the building opportunities for, for wildlife to thrive. So let me pause there for, uh, to draw breath um, and for you to maybe respond to, to some of those ideas uh, and, and we can discuss maybe some of these questions um, of what works well, what, what doesn't work quite so well, what are some of the issues that we need to tackle with. And uh, maybe you should have said at the outset that part of what Carolyn and I are trying to uh, work out here is as well as kind of understanding the scale of the problem, um, and, and where SNH can add value to that. Um, we, um, we run a series of sharing good practice events, um, and uh, I guess we're looking for, for contacts uh, for architects, construction, do people in the construction industry and so on, who are doing this kind of thing, um, and we can provide an opportunity uh, for that to be shared across a wider audience. So any ideas you have for um, contacts for people who are doing this kind of work, that we can follow up on. We'd, we'd really appreciate your, your contributions around that. For the moment, we do not have any questions or, or suggestions, but I would also encourage our online viewers to provide contact details or, let's say, uh, maybe uh, links to websites or documents or examples that uh, you might be interested in to uh, see or uh, use in, in, in further development of these ideas. Should we go on to the yes, next scale, I, maybe? Yes, I think, yes. Okay, we, we we'll, we'll continue on and, and go up to the, to the next scale, um, which is looking at the, the village, the town, the kind of neighbourhood, um, up from individual buildings. So, as well as all of the kind of issues in the, in the finer scale detail of designing buildings and how they sit within the landscape, at the next level up, um, there's a bunch of new um, um, issues, factors that come into play, um, which begin to lead into the kind of wider aspects of placemaking, uh, the connectivity of how all of these different elements come together, um, and the you know the society and the and the environmental features that emerge from those. Um, and one of the kind of key um, aspects of that that comes through in a lot of work around placemaking is is involving people, the people who are, who live and work in these places, uh, involving them in the kind of design and delivery. Of, of these um, places that are of consequence to them because they live there. Um, in a sense, that parallels the, um, the debates around co-production involving people in the design and delivery of services that, are, that matter to them um, that we've seen in the Christie Commission review of the future of public um, services in Scotland, um, which is very much part of you know, the way that local authorities and various others are working, for example, on community planning um, and single outcome agreements. Um, and with an emphasis there, that that's kind of getting more into understanding place at the neighbourhood level uh, and how we can work out um, um, solutions to those problems, um, ideally with the people who live in those areas. Um, there are all sorts of opportunities to use local, as local natural assets to, um, as resources in, in, in running buildings, um, local uh, renewable energy sources in wood or wind or small-scale hydro and so forth. Um, in thinking about um, the way that uh, green networks essentially um, exist at the finer scale in and around the building, how they link into wider green networks and green spaces and how they can be used to facilitate walking and cycling as the sort of first choice 
uh, in transport, um, the way streets link to that, excellent kind of policy guidance around that from Scottish government on designing streets, um, which says you know pretty much all you want to see in relation to creating walkable environments um, uh, and the need for that you know for those linkages to be made to, to the places that people want to go to in their daily business um, and uh, linking so green networks linking into streets and, and so forth. Um, needing to avoid soil sealing so that we have permeable surfaces, porous surfaces uh, that uh, reduce runoff rates and hence flood risk. And that takes you into kind of sustainable urban drainage um, and natural flood management. And again, this working with the grain of existing uh, habitats and landscapes. And here, of course, needing to think about the boundaries between the town and the country and the way that they fit together and interact. Uh, so again, a few images of that. This is from Finhorn in, in, in Venetia, where you know, I think here you can see a, a very kind of natural fit between the buildings and the and the countryside, you know, probably in stark contrast to to many of the uh, towns, villages, and so on that we see, where there's much stronger boundaries between the the houses um, and and the streets, or you know, the, the transport systems, and so forth. <clears throat> um, just to emphasize, here's a green roof, but you know, a green roof is arguably something that is. On building, but building sits in a, in a wider in a wider context. So it, it is very difficult to to draw hard and fast boundaries between the the different scales at which we might be interested in place and place making and wildlife and landscape. Um, here's the lovely building I always think from um, Perth, uh, my hometown, um, which sits you know very comfortably within the landscape. It's just on the outskirts outskirts of Perth if you're ever up that way uh, near the Broxton roundabout. Um, it's the old Norwich Union, or now the Aviva building, I think, um, but a really nice example of a, of a building that sits very comfortably within its landscape. Another example here of a green roof, where it's, this is basically a herb garden on top of a hotel, um, where the produce is used um, in the kitchens in the, in the hotel below. And <clears throat> indeed, here's the chef picking some apples um, from that herb garden. Uh, lots of interest in some cases in making use of temporary, temporary or temporary use of vacant land. Uh, here's an example of, um, of a community garden in Vancouver, um, where the local community are able to make use of this land before it's um, developed in one way or another. Uh, those of you of a certain age might think this looks a bit like Teletubby land, <laughs> um, but you know, quite a strident and you know, strong vision of, of, of how a village might look, um, you know, very much kind of in keeping with the grain of the, the local landscape and so on. Uh, this is Hunter Tsvassa's uh, work in, uh, in Austria. And just thinking about some of the wider aspects of um, distinctive design um, and how that relates to kind of wider place. Um, if you take any <clears throat> old town, as it were, in, in Scotland, uh, the borough towns here, for example, but, but equally you could look at um, the core of larger towns like Perth um, or cities such as Glasgow and Edinburgh. <clears throat> and what you tend to find is that um, if you can take a kind of imaginary timeline from the centre of town to the outskirts, um, then in the centre of the town you get a highly uh, walkable um, environment with mixed use, uh, riddled with bennels and alleyways and so on, so that it's very easy to get to where you want to go within a five minute walk and it's usually much quicker to walk than, than, than go by transport in any shape or form. Um, but as you extend that timeline outwards, things change quite dramatically along it. So that sort of pattern of a highly walkable, highly dense mixed use environment remains true up until about the 1950s, as it were. <clears throat> and then after that, um, the, uh, the character of the design is increasingly lower density, zoned for different uses and so on, becomes inherently unwalkable um, and it really revolves around the assumption that people are going to get about using the car. Um, so a five minute journey by car is a lot more than a five minute walkable uh, walking this journey. Um, so, and that stays true out to today really, where by the time you get to the outskirts, you're dealing with you know, very low densities that are difficult to service with public transport and so on, um, and, and very difficult to kind of walk around. Um, and that has important implications for health because if it's, you know, the assumption is that you're going to walk and go by public transport, then it's very difficult, for example, to build into your daily life the half hour of active walking exercise um, recommended for, for good public health and so on. So 
the impact of um, the, the built environment has quite profound impacts on ourselves and our health and so on. And just as we shape the world around us, so it shapes us too, um, quite literally in, in many ways. And these interactions, I think, are, are really important in, in thinking about place and place making. <clears throat> and so, yeah, just to emphasize uh, the importance of um, of creating places where it's easy to be physically active in a high quality environment which promotes a, a mental health as well a better mental health uh, all of these benefits um, and and helping at the same time to address many of the the costs of um, uh, some of the t development types that we've seen going up over the last sort of 50 to 70 years So again, um, I'll pause there, um, if I can, and, and invite questions um, around anything that you've heard so far, really. So, you know, thinking about those relationships between the fine scale detail of uh, buildings and place um, and what I've just been saying in terms of neighborhoods and so on. Um, so issues that I think begin to come up here around the distribution of costs and benefits and competing interests in terms of the, the provide, for example, the private interests in profit behind uh, a particular development um, at its point of sale, the, the developer typically has no, no further interest in place um, versus the kind of public goods um, in relation to longer term public health arising from the way that people are able to live out their lives um, in those places and the, the closeness with nature um, or not as the case may be associated with that. Um, how does this relate to questions around preventative spend? Um, here we're talking about much broader public benefits um, that accrue to a population. Um, in that case, it can be quite difficult to, to, to draw out a particular cause-effect relationship and, and justify that in terms of um, investing in assets to support wealth creation and well-being in the broader sense. In contrast, much of the kind of um, public policy debate around preventative spend, I think, is on transactional services. Uh, for example, healthcare, social care, education, and so on, where there's you know quite an immediate relationship between the cost of delivering that service and the benefits that might accrue to a particular individual, um, and and the, and, the, and the savings that might be made as a result of intervening earlier in the system. Um, to my mind, that's the same principles at play in placemaking, um, but because the the cause-effect relationships are more difficult to define. Um, it's a much more difficult dis discussion uh, to have um, in public policy. Um, again, fundamentally, is wh where is design in all of this? Um, if we see a chain of uh, uh, in any particular development running from design and master planning through planning and development and building and then ongoing maintenance of those assets and so on, um, you could argue that that's at the moment quite a fragmented chain handled by different bodies at different stages. Um, who oversees, as it were, how all of that kind of comes together uh, and, and influences the places that, that we see. And as I kind of indicated earlier, um, by mention to designing streets, for example, I think the policy context here is, is really very strong. Um, you know, the, the messages around placemaking in the new national performance planning framework, NPF3, and Scottish planning policy are very, very strong on, on placemaking and so on. Um, but I suppose if I react to that as an individual, uh, walking around towns and cities and looking at the kinds of developments that I see going up all over the place, um, in many, most cases, they don't seem to align with those kind of policy ambitions, as it were. So what's going on here? Why is there a sort of a mismatch between the, the very clear thrust of um, policy um, aspirations and in practice, the kinds of developments that we see going up. You know, what, what's your kind of take on the issues there? Um, and how important are these links from the kind of fine scale detail um, in buildings and, and their cartilage and so on to the coarser scale around neighborhoods um, and upwards into sustainable urban drainage and the regional scale and flood management and so on? Um, I guess my premise is that getting the detail right matters at all sorts of scales and things will begin to emerge at coarser scales. But you might argue the reverse of that and say that a very strong top-down um, policy-led framework, does that help you to, to realize the fine-scale detail um, in, in nature and its networks, if you like? Um, what's your take on that? And uh, I suppose finally, just 
given that this is a webinar and I think we've already attracted people from outside of the UK, what's your experience of, of how all this um, plays out in, in wherever you are? Um, we have fine examples from continental Europe of some really nice uh, examples of fine scale detail in buildings and for wildlife friendly buildings and so on and places associated with that and a lot of that seems to come down to the power of munis municipal authorities, our equivalent uh, local authorities, to, to determine the shape of places in those, in those areas. Um, their ability to say no that's not good enough to a developer we prefer it if you come back with something along these lines. Um, so is this about kind of local authorities needing more powers or have they got the powers and it's just the will to use them? Um, how do you see all of that playing out? There is one question uh, I hope you see on, on your screen from Will Woodrow of Woodrow Sustainable Solutions LTD. Okay, let me just have a look at that. Okay. If you, do you see? Or, I, I see it. I can read it. Okay. Uh, he asks whether some of, well, or gives a comment, whether some of these features will work to depend on wider issues as well. For example, there is no point providing bird or bat roosts if there are no local feeding areas. What options are currently available, if any, to make sure such links can be assured to make features in buildings a potential success? Uh, just to comment that uh, Woodrow Sustainable Sol Solutions is a company based in Ireland. Okay. I uh, will. Thank you very much for that. I, I agree. I mean, I think that, that just as the um, various scales of the, the built environment interlink and are interdependent, um, clearly um, wildlife doesn't recognize those boundaries or the boundaries between the built environment and the what you might call the natural environment, wider landscapes, the farmed landscape and so on and and so yes i think we need to to make those connections and provide those feeding and foraging areas for, for wildlife um, both within the built environment and how that interacts with with the wider um, the countryside around around the built environment um, so i very strongly agree with you um, and i think that's probably a challenge certainly here in scotland through the scottish rural development uh, program and to make those links, which I, I would you know, probably strongly suspect at the moment, are very much focused on farms in their own right and wouldn't necessarily um, make those connections between uh, wildlife on the farm landscape and wildlife on, in, in urban areas and, and how they interact and, and interdepend upon each other. So I agree with you, but, but, I, but I don't think we've got an answer to that yet. Okay. Uh there are more comments. Uh, Keith Pierce of Pierce Design. From our experience, you need to bring together a, a specific uh, groups or individuals of individuals in, in advance interested in these issues. Developing a housing site and then trying to find interested people does not work. How we create public interest is the main issue. What does what ideas do you have for this? Yeah, I think I, well, I agree with. Your kind of premise there that um, if you're going to join up these chains, then drawing in people from from different parts of the chain, I think, is going to be a hugely helpful step forward. Um, I'm interested in your remark about getting people um, more aware of these issues, and I think that's really is an important issue. Um, often, the kind of the discussion um, that, that I've had with some developers, certainly. Um, over the years will be along the lines of the developers saying, well, people buy our houses, so this is what they want. Um, when I think about myself as somebody buying a house, I don't feel kind of empowered to, to, um, uh, to strongly influence um, the, the details of the design of that house and where it sits and so on. I kind of feel that I've, I've just been given, well, take it or leave it. You know? <laughs> if you don't like this one, go and find another one someplace else. So I think that dynamic is a really complicated one. Um, you know, the, as I say, often the, the, the message from developers is that, um, well, this is the kind of stuff that people are built, buying, so this is the kind of thing that they want. Um, and yet when you talk to individuals and so on about these kinds of issues, when you've space and time to develop these ideas, they'll often say, well, um, yeah, we want more kind of wildlife friendly places and, and, and better walkable environments and so on. But, but how do we go about influencing that? So, again, I think there's a kind of disjunct there between um, 
some of the some of the interests and, and how they're able to kind of participate in in these decisions Keith Pierce has also provided a link to the website uh, with, with the comment our projects are in Croatia where local authorities are happy to be involved so okay. that's some additional information just going to say um, a little bit about engaging the community there from the development planning processes that we operate a plan-led system in Scotland. Um, so there is an opportunity at the when the sites are allocated when we go through that sort of allocations process for more community engagement and that has been actively encouraged. So that's another way of actually getting some sort of community buy-in um, into this process very early on. That's right, and that reminds me that um, a few years ago, the Scottish Government led some charrettes exercises, didn't they, around um, particular developments at various scales, and I think Aberdeen was one, and there was sort of a couple in Fife, um, which by all accounts, I wasn't personally involved in them, but they were, you know, by all accounts, highly successful in engaging communities and actually over a very intensive three to five day period, creating, you know, quite an informative master plan um, for how these uh, developments might take shape. But if anybody was actually involved in any of those and can reflect on how that process went and uh, and indeed whether those products of those that engage with those areas, we'd be really interested to hear about that from your experience on the ground. I think it's also about front loading the process, you know, as much as possible. So you're building up that ownership and that stakeholder engagement right from the beginning and that can often save a lot of time uh, in the longer term if you've got the right people around the right table um, from the start of a project it's obviously um, a bit easier to manage that and to map to see what those expectations are from the, from the, from the beginning yeah and and while um, some some people might argue that it all costs more and who's going to pay for that you know ultimately you could step back from that and say well if that process gets you better design places that fit more with the kinds of what people want who are going to live in those places and that helps to um, defray potential social and environmental costs arising from, from not doing it right, um, then surely that's all got to be to the good. Should For the we... moment we don't have any comments or questions so you, might, you can continue with your presentation. Okay, I will. Um, so thank you for that and do keep the comments coming please. Okay, so um, we'll look now at regeneration and developments in more urban settings and you know, quite a lot of this will blur with the previous section in, in many ways, but um, we can make some very bold statements about um, buildings and what they say um, in, in urban settings, uh, a rather fine block of flats here um, uh, from, from Austria. And whilst this doesn't have a great deal to do with um, as it were, well, there is a kind of a green roof on part of this, but um, I, I wanted to put this one in as a, as a kind of way of drawing attention to the fact that um, we can make some very bold statements about um, buildings and their use and, and, and how they sit within our kind of community and places. Um, so this is a Spitalau, um, a waste from energy plant um, in Vienna, in Austria. Um, it was built in the um, 1960s and 70s, I think. Um, but refurbished, uh, I think, in the early 80s um, and runs some very high-tech equipment. Um, they have incredibly low emission um, uh, emission standards. Um, well, Vienna, Austria as a whole has very low emission standards. This this plant works well within, the, within that envelope. Um, and at some parts of the plant, there's a very public uh, display of the current emissions associated with running the plant. It's connected to district heat networks and so on. Um, they run tours, there's a cafe, it's very much kind of a part of the community um, and I kind of contrast that in some ways with, again, in, in Perth, um, a recent application for a waste from energy plant, um, essentially a very large box with a pipe, um, was rejected ultimately, um, but the, there it was kind of, tried the, the location for it was very much kind of squirreled away, um, almost out of sight, out of mind. Uh, was the attempt and so on. And I think maybe there's a lesson for us in there that uh, if waste from energy is an important part of our, our lives um, as a consequence of uh, uh, the, uh, um, our economy and, and uh, waste management and resource use and so on, 
um, then these ought to be kind of uh, things that we live with uh, rather than trying to shunt them out of sight, out of mind. And maybe that kind of change in mind sh mindset would have quite a profound impact on the way that we use resources um, uh, if we knew that we had to live with the consequences of those choices very directly, perhaps more directly than we do at the moment. So again, we have a similar set of issues to the other two scales of um, um, building design and development that I was talking about. Um, we have reinforcing issues here about involving people in, in these discussions, uh, creating walkable environments, um, designing nature into buildings and structures at, at various scales and, and the potential benefits of that in terms of shading from trees, for example, and cooling and airflow and air quality. Um, I've even seen pictures, I haven't got any here, unfortunately, of how trees have been used within streets to, to encourage their use as streets as opposed to roads, uh, which are primarily for, for vehicles. Um, issues to do with local provenance and diversity. Um, and some of the wider benefits from, from green spaces and green networks here, uh, looking at uh, uh, their role in local food production um, and, and local assets and resources uh, that the communities can use in, in one way or another, whether that's drying spaces um, or um, uh, in some cases using water in sustainable urban drainage schemes as, as heat sinks, for example, and heat sources. And again, the connections between the, the various scales of the of the built environment. So sometimes in, in zoning areas for different uses, we create some problems for ourselves. Um, this is a slide from uh, uh, Russell Jones, who I mentioned earlier in one of our sharing good practice events. Um, the, and there are some very severe kind of social, apart from social inequalities, which obviously arise from, from you know, developing in this kind of a way, um, there are some very strong negative feedbacks that arise, as it were, by um, diminishing tax returns in, a, in poorer areas, um, which you know, prevents further investment in those places. Um, so you get into a kind of downward spiral. Um, you know, there's quite a lot of sociological literature on, on the impact of, um, of, of those sorts of features in inner city um, um, deterioration over the last few decades in, in, for example, various cities within the UK and the USA. And these are some slides from um, Richard Rogers and the Urban Task Force looking at um, uh, scale of development and density and mixed use of developments um, in, and, and how, the, how walkable those environments are and the kind of services um, that arise depending on different um, scales of um, um, dense, housing densities, for example. Um, so here at sort of 20 households per hectare, um, very low population densities, very difficult to service um, with public transport, um, very difficult to walk to the kinds of things that you might want to get to every day, shops, uh, schools and what have you. And um, when we go up to the to next scale at around 45 households per hectare, um, reduced land take obviously, um, uh, and things, some of the things that you might want to get to on a daily basis um, Becoming, becoming within reach, but still um, difficult by and large. And it's only really when you get to 70 odd households per hectare and above um, that we have uh, the makings of a kind of higher density mixed use uh, environment where it's much easier to, to get around by walking and cycling and active transport. Um, I would say there's obviously important caveats to this that um, crude um, rules of thumb around housing density, for example, um, and not what this is all about. Um, that needs to be used in a more sophisticated way uh, to think about mixed use and, and, and the built environment that we're trying to create. Um, an observation that um, many um, housing density thresholds, as it were, in, in some development plans at least, uh, are still at around 15 to 20 households per hectare on the urban fringe. Um, we obviously need to think about how they connect with transport nodes and various other service intersections. Um, and, of, and a final kind of reflection that um, in some of the more uh, desirable um, areas of, of uh, existing towns in the Victorian, from the Victorian developments and what have you, and they often will be up at sort of 100 to 120 households per hectare. Um, and they do that without being necessarily very high rise. So high, high density doesn't necessarily mean high rise. 
and again, if you take that kind of rule of thumb of a five minute walk, you need to include the, the vertical as well as the horizontal distance that you might have to cover to get from your front door to whatever it is you're going to in the wider built environment. Um, but I find these slides useful, excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, I find those slides useful in just <coughs> illustrating some of the features, emergent features that arise <coughs> from different scales of development. I shouldn't talk so much. <coughs> and here's another way of looking at that. Um, these are slides from David Sim uh, from Gale Architects, who again contributed to one of our Sharing Good Practice events, where <coughs> he was looking at the um, the signals and the cues that we get from uh, designing um, at various, depending on various scales and so on. So here, um, the image shows a, a, a built design based on getting around by car, uh, and because the assumption is that these vehicles will be travelling at, um, say, 40 or 50 kilometres an hour, you need quite large signs that people can read at a glance as they're travelling along at those sorts of speeds. So the whole scale of the built environment is then tuned into faster moving vehicles um, and um, they're not the kind of uh, the same sort of level of detail uh, that people individually walking um, will, will experience or they experience a very different environment uh, to this one which is predominantly designed around the car and so by contrast uh, this is the scale of um, design and detail that you get um, when you're thinking about designing around a a five kilometer per hour architecture and environment made for, for walking, which much, which with much smaller spaces, um, this is small detailed design cues and signals um, that people can respond to in all sorts of different ways. And um, again, just to illustrate the, the relationship between the detail, if you like, of green roofs at various scales and how they might link into um, uh, sustainable urban drainage. Um, here is an example from Sydney in Australia. So at the regional scale, we get a, um, a similar set of questions to the last lot around neighbourhood and town. Um, and some of these things on the face of it seem quite remote from individual buildings because we're dealing with, with neighbourhoods and towns and so on. Um, but I think I would argue that those interdependencies and interactions are, are vitally important. Um, and as you'll gather from a theme of my commentary, as it were, is that getting the detail right in individual buildings um, does matter. There's, there's helped, it, um, it creates the sort of template at which things can then emerge at subsequent scales. And, and all of that revolves then around understanding place and how it works in practice and then designing and, and designing detail um, around that understanding of place and how it's likely to work. So since that's a similar set of questions to the ones we asked previously, I'll move ahead um, to the sort of final scale um, in this section before we move to retrofit um, and thinking about the landscape scale. Um, so we've thought a bit about how just detail at the individual level of a building, links into wider sustainable urban drainage and green space and green networks and so on. And if we're thinking about the landscape scale, we need to, to think more about how that all connects with wider habitat networks and, and woodland networks and so on, um, which I think relates to the point that um, Will or Keith was making about, you know, what are the feeding and foraging areas for the wildlife in towns? How does that interact with, um, with wider habitats? Um, we're beginning to explore some of those ideas in Scotland through the Central Scotland um, Green Network, which is a, covers an enormous part of uh, Central Scotland from essentially Ayrshire over towards um, Fife um, and um, strongly aligned to the many of the old coal working areas in Central Scotland and uh, restoring some of those environments. Um, but they're thinking about how those green networks work at various scales um, that I've just been talking about. Um, and how we link the, you know, the sustainable urban drainage schemes to the wider level of catchment and going up beyond that into the river basin management plans associated with the implementation of the Water Framework Directive. 
Um, there's a link there, uh, which I don't know if you can access in the, the recording, but if you go to our Scottish Natural Heritage uh, website, um, we have um, a tool um, which is called Talking About Our Place, um, which is a way of encouraging dialogue, discussion um, with communities about their places, uh, the places that they live and what they feel is important about them, um, kind of gathering information and insights on, on what people value in their place and how that contributes to their sense of place. Um, in, in thinking about this scale in particular, I think as well as all of the other scales, as I've indicated earlier, um, we need to think about longer term environmental change signals, particularly climate change, um, and um, how we use the, the wider landscape to retain um, stocks of carbon, either in woodland or, or peat rich soils, which are a very important resource um, throughout Scotland, um, both in terms of lowland bogs um, and the wider more extensive um, upland um, blanket bogs and so forth. And thinking about both adaptation and mitigation. So placemaking is, is where both sides of that coin are very important. We obviously need to create places that help us to lead low carbon lives, lifestyles, um, but a degree of impacts of climate changes are now inevitable over the next 30 to 50 years or more at least. Um, and so places need more and more to be able to cope with, the, with that changing environment. Um, so this links into wider discussions around resilience um, and how do, we, how do we build in um, resilience to, to our places. And again, connectivity, uh, the relationships between green networks and paths to buildings and streets and wider public transport and, and transport um, networks at different scales through to long distance routes and, uh, and transport strategies. Have we a comment there from Dave? Yes, uh, from Dave uh, Gorman of the University of Edinburgh. How can we engage communities with place making and ensure it's sustainable? There are sometimes differences of opinion regarding facilities. For, for example, not in my backyard is a nimbism about recycling facilities people relying on motorized transport to commute and therefore an increased demand for parking and disillusionment following previous, maybe uh, badly experienced development. Yes. How can we engage communities with placemaking and ensure it's sustainable? Uh, thanks for that, Dave. Um, hi. I, I, I agree I, and I think that is um, you know, a huge challenge. I mentioned earlier the Charette's work that um, that has been done in relation to um, to new potentially new developments in various places. Um, but I suspect what perhaps what you're talking about here, as much as anything, is is existing places and how do we retrofit a lot of these ideas um, for more sustainable living into existing places where people live and work, uh, which can give rise to you know these kind of nimbyism and so forth. Um, I, I mean, I, I've come on to say a bit more about retrofit in a, in a moment, um, but, I, but I think um, you've kind of hit the nail on the head in a way. Um, I would hope that a lot of this um, should be brought out through um, further developments in community planning and the, the single outcome agreements that um, local authorities are working towards in, in Scotland. Um, there's a very strong emphasis in the new guidance around that, well, that came out last December, around understanding place and developing place-based plans and um, basing the, those on um, communications with the people who live in those places. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that most community planning and single outcome agreements over the last three to five years and beyond has been quite, quite top-down, um, a forum in which kind of agency level discussions can take place but with very little connection to communities, um, the people who are living and working in these places. Um, so I think, you know, I certainly welcome that as, a, as, as the way forward. Um, and, and, um, and I think there's a kind of an onus on, on all sorts of, on all public bodies really to, to, make, to, be, to be able to demonstrate that they, they are talking to and listening to communities. Uh, clearly there's a kind of practical problem there for many bodies that it's very difficult to talk to five million people 
Um, but I think you know we need to be doing enough of it so that we we can demonstrate that we have a good understanding of the the real issues on the ground, um, and then how we can how we can practically address those, um, and, and apply that to to wider aspects of our policy development and implementation, even if we're not able to have those one-to-one -one discussions with every individual in Scotland. I wonder whether um, part of this is actually understanding the, the wider place as well. So we've been looking at very small scale allocations and master planning exercise, and I actually wonder whether, uh, linking into your last comment, um, Clive, it's, we need more of an understanding of the of, of a settlement um, level and how how settlements actually work, how, how how they function, how people use them, um, and that um, will help to link communities and actually inform a lot of this decision making. You know about how how communities can actually interact with the plan planning process. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, and that I think you know ties in very nicely with being very clear about what are the problems that we need to solve here. And again, I think that you know that's a very secure platform for design. To, to see itself as having a role um, in these kinds of discussions. Okay, let me go on and say something about um, retrofit. Um, okay, so these are some statistics that you, you may be familiar with. Um, they come from a climate change perspective. Um, but um, so if we look at um, the buildings around us, somewhere between 65% and 80% and well over two thirds of those buildings in 2050 are the ones, sorry, the buildings that we'll see in 2050 are the ones that we will see now. Um, so I agree very strongly with that transforming places is a hugely important part of um, the, the development and planning agenda, but that's primarily about new places. Um, so the question for me is how do we retrofit some of these ideas to the places that we've created over the last 50, 70 years or whatever? And that's an enormous challenge in terms of um, climate change um, because emission reductions um, are primarily in the existing building stock in one way or another. We have to create the opportunities for those within the existing building stock. Um, but in just the same way that if we're wanting to create more wildlife friendly buildings, more wildlife friendly places, higher quality local environments in which people live out their lives and so on, then we have to think about how we retrofit these ideas to the existing built environment, which perhaps hasn't paid as much attention to those things uh, that, as, as we'd like to, to have seen. So I think, um, for me, there's a very strong, there's equally a strong playback here into the into the existing, the new building in the existing development and um, uh, development framework, in the sense that buildings that go up today are essentially building tomorrow's legacy. Um, and I think that that sets the bar really high. If you think about um, uh, the the quality of the built environment that we're seeing going up today and the kinds of problems that, that we might be confronting in 2050, um, where we'll be needing to talk about a, a zero carbon economy, um, not just a low carbon economy. And we can be pretty confident about that in 2050 because it's kind of what we should be doing today, really. Um, so. So there's a very strong sense there in terms of the, you know, the buildings that we're seeing up, going up today, are they fit for a zero carbon economy? And if the answer is no, then you know, what are we going to do about that? What can we do about that? Huge challenge. So here are some ideas about how we, how we might retrofit um, existing environments. Um, this is a slide again from, from Russell Jones from the Glasgow Central Population Health. It depicts a kind of an American street, again, quite big scale. Uh, um, quite a distance from one side of the road to the other. And it is a road because it's primarily about cars, not people. Um, we could begin to introduce a wider diversity of buildings and uses and mixes within, within this environment. Um, and, you know, here's Edinburgh Princess Street uh, with its tram system in a couple of years' time with cycleways and various other things. So there are ways in which we can, um, we can transform um, uh, environments, existing environments, at least in, in theory. Um, these are a couple of slides from Raymond Young, uh, another contributor to one of our sharing of practice events, uh, looking at a real example of, of transformation, uh, this time from Fairfield in Perth, um, which was in 1986, uh, a rather degraded uh, housing estate, um, transformed into you know, a, a rather different place. Um, 
when we're talking about the scale of regeneration, I think there are some enormous kind of social challenges in the way that we go about that in the UK, which has typically been about sort of clearing out existing areas, redeveloping them, and then it's very difficult to recreate the sort of communities that were in those places before people were moved out and the areas were regenerated. And I guess the classic kind of contrast to that would be the way that Barcelona was redeveloped uh, on its kind of grid system where they were able to keep existing communities pretty well intact at the same time as regenerating and revitalizing the city in all sorts of ways. Um, some very good work on that by um, uh, somebody whose name will come back to me, sorry, I forget just now, at London School of Economics. And maybe we should be thinking about green walls as well as green networks. Um, uh, there's a guy called Peter Head who used to work for um, uh, uh, one of the big consultancy firms. Um, he's now on his own, as it were. Um, but he's got some very visionary things to say about um, the cities of the future and the way that they can interact with existing ecosystems and, and creating um, cities that are very much more in tune with, with ecosystems, uh, natural systems, and providing food and energy and, and water. Uh, you know, all the things that we need for, for life in, uh, oh dear, this one, oh, okay. Um, so another example of transformation, this is from Seoul in South Korea, where in the 1970s they built a kind of huge American style um, um, motorway um, into the center of the city. Um, it was carrying 160,000 vehicles a day um, in the early 2000s. The mayor took a kind of an executive decision of reinstating the river, putting in place um, uh, public transport and you know, much reduced road capacity. Um, and some of the kind of knock-on benefits of that were to do with uh, lower pollution, uh, massive increase in park space, green networks, green travel routes, active travel into the town. Um, it's a very important part of you know, cooling uh, temperatures citywide, particularly in the summer months, it gets very hot in that part of the world. Um, reducing traffic views, um, better public transport options and so on. So it is possible to do things at a, at a fantastically grand scale, um, you know, if we have the will to do it. Uh, another nice example, the high rise, the high line in New York, which you may have heard, ago, heard about the you know, reinvigoration of, a, of an old railway line um, as, a, as a, a linear path, uh, linear park uh, and pathway and route for people and communities in, in parts of New York. And thinking big uh, here in Chicago, a 24 acre green roof, um, come park, come sustainable urban drainage, come you know, lots of other potential benefits um, deriving from that. This is another slide from Raymond Young, but here thinking about um, uh, how we, there's two things here. There's one about how we think about designing places, um, starting with people, and the spaces that they occupy, the buildings and how they fit into those, and then transport how they get about and so on. I think in delivery, um, it should probably be the reverse of this. So putting in place first a, a sustainable transport system and then the buildings. And then when people begin to occupy those buildings, um, they have a transport system that they can use. Uh, and I think there's a very important behavior change message in here where typically what we find is that people are much more likely to change behaviors um, at points in their life where there's a big change happening anyway. So a new job, moving to a new place, all these sorts of events can, can stimulate people to think and re-evaluate re in a sense their habits um, and maybe taking opportunities to change them. Um, and so new places, new transport systems are you know, potentially a vitally important part of that. Um, but if we put up buildings and then think about putting in a transport system later, um, by the time the new transport system comes into play, it'll effectively be too late for people to change their habits. Their, their habits will, they haven't had the opportunity to change them and they'll just carry on with the same old habits in the new buildings, even when there's a new transport system to play with later in the day. So I think, you know, that whole emphasis on people um, in the design stages through to the development is, is really, really important. And, and one of the things I'd say about um, indirectly or directly throughout the last half hour, hour or so, I've spoken about you know, the benefits that we can accrue from green spaces and green networks in all sorts of ways. And I think that's true if they're designed and delivered with all of those benefits in mind and there's a degree of public participation and engagement in designing the green space and green networks so that they can deliver this range of benefits. Um, but if 
a piece of green space, green space is just kind of parachuted in without that dialogue in that wider context, um, then the chances are to be very much more limited in terms of the benefits that people can derive from it. Um, so there are big challenges for, for us as much as anyone um, in terms of you know, how we go about engaging with people in the design and delivery of green spaces and places and, and everything else. Kind of coming back to the challenge that, that Dave was uh, alluding to or mentioned earlier on. And by way of kind of conclusion, really, um, none of this is really very new. Here's John Muir talking about the interconnectedness and interdependency of nature uh, at all sorts of scales in 1911. Um, I mentioned, uh, if I didn't, I should have mentioned Patrick Geddes really earlier on. I alluded to him in the kind of workplace folk slide right at the beginning. Um, but all of these ideas that I've been talking about would have been highly familiar to him. They would have been highly familiar to Ebenezer Howard talking about the Garden City movement in the 1920s, 30s and so on. Um, they were clearly highly relevant to the, to the uh, uh, in relation to the uh, pattern language book I was talking about from 1972. So there's, there's no shortage of all of this kind of stuff. It's a mainstay of, um, you know, planning courses for undergraduates and so on and MSCs. Um, but as I said at the beginning, Whilst all of that's true, uh, and the policy framework is, is supportive of, of creating these kinds of places, why is it that we're not seeing them um, in the kind of abundance that we might expect to, given that degree of expertise uh, and the way that those messages are embedded in various communities in architecture and planning and design and so on, why are we not seeing those in the places, or why are we not seeing that reflected in the places that we're building today and that we have been building over the last 50 years or more. Um, so again, just to kind of um, pause and reflect, I think this would probably be the last slide. Um, and so any kind of final reflections that you might have um, around what I've been talking about, um, how can we, do you know people who are designing wild friend, wildlife friendly features into existing buildings and their curtilage uh, and, and uh, regenerating places as greener places with green streets, uh, green networks, green spaces, and so forth. Um, do you think that's important in making places better for people? Um, what needs to happen to make it happen in, more, more commonly? Is that an issue for the construction industry? Is it an issue for planning local authority? Who, who's, who's got to play a role in this? Um, who's doing it in Scotland or elsewhere? At what kind of scale? Um, and where do we go from here? We have uh, one more comment and question from Will Woodrow. He's asking, are there two things going on here? In the first instance, there is a need to encourage biodiversity into communities uh, in order to both help wildlife and create better places for people to live. On the second hand, how much of an opportunity is there to include key priorities from biodiversity plans into developments? developments? This second instance uh, may require much more site or project-specific works aimed at benefiting a group of species or, well, uh, there is a limit, obviously, to the text we can receive, uh, but uh, you get uh, yeah. the message. Uh, well, I think that's a really important point and a good one. Um, I, I also um, do some work for the... Um, just to reflect a little bit on biodiversity action plans and the current emphasis on those. And there's a whole, often they, they take, for, for very good um, uh, statutory reasons, um, a very strong focus on species of conservation concern um, that are listed on you know, various pieces of legislation in different countries in Ireland or in the UK, Scotland, and so on. Um, and one of the, I also work for the Open University, and one of the exercises that we get students to do is to reflect on an area and think about the ecosystem services um, that, that, that might be present in that area. So it could be flood management, it could be food production, uh, it could be air quality, a whole range of things. It could just be the, the quality of the local environment and the, the sort of cultural um, values associated with that. And then we ask them to write a biodiversity action plan based on the continued delivery and enhancement of those services. And, and I think that, in my experience of having marked those kind of that, that, that line of thinking, is that that leads to a very different type of biodiversity action plan from the one that's developed primarily on the basis of species and habitats of conservation and concern, even when those, those plans might um, illustrate 
the contribution that those species and habitats can make to wider ecosystem services. Um, and for me, I think the, um, the, the wider aspect of looking at ecosystem services and functions uh, at a kind of in a wider level, um, I think can help people more generally see how those natural assets are vitally important in one way or another for wealth creation and well-being and, and leads to a discussion about investing in those assets to support wealth creation and well-being uh, rather than looking at the costs of action to support species of conservation concern which is largely where the discussion has been for the last 20 or 30 years I'd say um, and so I think that's quite a big challenge for the for the current if you like conservation paradigm and the way that we see um, the role of species and habitats of conservation concern contributing to wider ecosystems, ecosystem services and so on. And you know, arguably that's where the new Scottish biodiversity strategy positions itself. And, and that's why I think um, there's a, as yet, um, how can I put it, a discussion that has to be had with the conservationists, as you, if you like, in how they see their role in contributing to that much bigger agenda. Okay, thank you. Uh, we don't have any um, comments uh, yet. If you have any uh, um, comments, no, but Caroline? Just, just um, leading on from what Clive was saying there, um, I think the whole ecosystem approach links in quite nicely to the sort of uh, the wider place, the appreciation and the, the knowledge of, of how the wider place functions. And that's not just within the settlement, it's actually beyond the settlement. So. Um, flood storage, for example, happens beyond a settlement, and it's it's really getting the message. Um, or it can happen beyond the settlement, um, but it's really getting the message as to how those really important functions um, link into the well-being for that for that settlement as as a whole. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And uh, I mean, one of the things that was just beginning to kind of bubble up um, two or three years ago, when, when I was doing the work on placemaking for SNH, was I think it was in Japan where they were beginning to kind of see um, towns and cities and developments as parts of ecosystems and this kind of distinction that we, artificial distinction that we often make between towns and cities and ecosystems is wholly unrealistic. You know, apart from anything, uh, a town is a part of an ecosystem by virtue of where it is situated, whether that's on a river or a coast or wherever in a landscape. Um, but it also interacts with, with wider ecosystems in the, in the goods consumed uh, whether that's energy or food or water or stuff, um, whatever, there is an interaction between uh, the people living in towns and cities and, and wider ecosystems through the resource use and so on. So, you know, the, it is inescapable, inescapable uh, that towns and cities are part of ecosystems, whether directly or, or indirectly. Uh, and, and, I, and I think you're right that, you know, we've somehow lost sight of that um, over the last few years, and I think that probably comes back to your original slide, Branka, um, the interconnectedness and interdependency between these things isn't necessarily served as well by the current kind of um, administrative arrangements um, across the public sector and, and sectors in the economy and so on, where people can be quite narrowly focused within that framework on their business and not wanting to tread their toes on other people's business. Um, as we've been doing in the last hour or so. Um, but, but I think, to, me, to my mind, that's all very helpful in understanding how these things interact and interdepend with one another. Thank you very much. We do not have any more questions, and I think we are now close to at the time uh, of our webinar. So first of all, I would like to thank you both, Clive and Caroline, for presentations, for preparation of, of this webinar. And I would like to invite our online viewers to send their comments and suggestions and we will forward them to you. So this is not the end of conversation, it can continue. Uh, thanks again. And before we close, I would just like to draw attention of our online viewers to a few